and welcome to 5MI Weekly. Today, let's talk about sex ed again. Last week, we defined education and we found out how controversial it becomes when its main learning topic is sex. I also left you with a question of whether you think sex should be taught in a minimal or comprehensive level of education. So what's your answer? Wait! Before you answer, let's find out what others have to say about answering this question. Amy Bleakley and her colleagues at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania surveyed a nationally representative sample of 1,096 U.S. adults about sex education and found more than 80% of them believed a comprehensive level of education is the best method for teaching human sexuality. Bleakley also found more than half of those surveyed believed minimal levels of education should not be used for teaching human sexuality. Minimal levels of education for teaching human sexuality are called abstinence-only programs. The sole purpose of abstinence-only programs is to make people abstain from sexual activity. These programs are highly moralistic and judgmental and are driven by ideologies lacking any medical or scientific evidence. Comprehensive levels of education for teaching human sexuality are simply called comprehensive sex education programs. Comprehensive sex education programs are driven by medical and scientific research for the sole purpose of facilitating the development of sexually healthy people. Comprehensive sex education programs cover a variety of topics that may include anatomy and physiology, development, relationships, sexually transmitted infections, safe sex, pregnancy, communication and goal setting skills, and accessing reliable information about sex and sexuality. All comprehensive sex education programs include the topic of abstinence. In all the topics within comprehensive sex education programs are taught at an age appropriate level. For example, for the topic of anatomy and physiology, kindergarten through second graders would be expected to know proper names for body parts, including male and female anatomy. For third through fifth graders, they'd be expected to be able to describe male and female reproductive systems, including body parts and their functions. For sixth through eighth graders, they'd be expected to describe male and female sexual and reproductive systems, including body parts and their functions. And for ninth through 12th graders, they'd be expected to be able to describe the human sexual response cycle, including the role hormones play. Interestingly, and certainly counter to what most media outlets would have us believe, Bleakley found a majority of Americans support comprehensive sex education regardless of whether they identify themselves as being conservative, moderate, or liberal. Among those, adults who describe themselves as conservatives, 70% support comprehensive sex education programs, while 86% of moderates and 92% of liberals support comprehensive sex education programs. In fact, even evangelical Christians appear to be supportive of comprehensive sex education. When Lauren Dent and Patricia Maloney from Texas Tech University interviewed evangelical Christian parents about sex education, it was clear that the parents believed their opposition to abstinence-based sex education aligned with a silent majority of evangelical Christians. And it may further surprise you to know, because it certainly surprised me to know, that Bleakley's findings of U.S. adults being overly supportive of comprehensive sex education is nothing new. As long ago as 1943, the Gallup poll found 68% of Americans 
were supportive of sex education in schools. And by 1985, this support had risen to where the current numbers are today, in about the 80% range. In addition to the general US population supporting comprehensive sex education, so too do science, medical, and psychology professionals from around the world, including the World Health Organization, the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine, the American Psychological Association, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Public Health Association, and the American School Health Association. So we now know what typical abstinence-only and comprehensive sex education programs are composed of. We also know a majority of the general public, as well as every major medical and scientific society is supportive of comprehensive sex education programs over abstinence-based ones. But I still don't know whether you think sex should be taught by abstinence only or comprehensive sex education programs. Before I really, really get your answer to this question, we need to pose one more question. What effects, if any, do sex education programs have on their students? Let's save answering this question until next week, which gives you another week's time to formulate your answer and contemplate the benefits of abstinence only and comprehensive forms of sex education. Till next week.